It's been a good little while, but I want to welcome you back to the Between Clean Sheets podcast. This is the second episode, and I know you're wondering, Cheyenne, why did it take you so long to put another episode out? Like, what's the deal? Um, It's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. As our girl T. Swift would say, there is just so much that goes into doing this, and I've learned a lot, but I'm also sitting on, oh, I don't know, like half a dozen episodes, half a dozen fantastic conversations, of which this is one. I had the opportunity to sit down with Drew Moore from the Colorado Rapids when they came to D.C. over Labor Day weekend, and he played his 18th season in Major League Soccer this year. When we sat down, I had a hunch that this would probably be either the last or the penultimate season of his career, but of all the things we talked about, that wasn't really something that I wanted to confirm. The goal with these conversations is always to bring kind of a human element and some personality to a league that we depending on who's listening, all know and love or are getting to know or want to know more about. And in lieu of, especially for me as a DC United fan, the product on the field being super compelling, I want to make off the field conversations ones worth listening to and ones worth being a part of. So Drew Moore got his start in 2005. He played at first with FC Dallas, then did 10-ish non-consecutive seasons with the Colorado Rapids and also played in Toronto during their um, pretty dominant stint from like 2015 to 2017, 2018. Here is the picture I want to paint for you for Drew Moore's first season in Major League Soccer. At that point, there were only 12 teams and only 16 games a season, which is insane. There are currently 28 teams, by the way, and I think 34 regular season matches. So we've more than doubled both of those (laughs) figures in the past 17, 18 years. Taylor Twelman actually won the Golden Boot that year. I know you guys are familiar with him. And Clint Dempsey, who played with Twelman at the New England Revolution, hadn't even left for England yet. Some other things of note Current Austin FC coach Josh Wolf was playing for the Kansas City Wizards and scored 10 goals and 10 assists. Also the Chicago Fire, who are going through a slump in the way that DC United is right now, they were averaging 17,000 fans per game that year, which is pretty impressive. A completely different space. I'm pretty sure the San Jose Earthquakes got the supporter shield that year. So a completely different Major League Soccer experience and an interesting start for a guy like Drew Moore, who has seen this league just grow, shift, change, and so much more. And it was awesome to talk to him, especially in person. But the one thing that I do think suffered because of that opportunity is the audio, which is just to reiterate the fact that I'm learning a lot about podcasting and understanding that there is a lot to be improved upon. I do hope as you listen to this conversation, you enjoy getting to know Drew more as much as I do. He did in fact announce his retirement ahead of Colorado Rapids last regular season game, knowing that they were not going to make it to the playoffs. And this is what he said. It's super, super cute. When I was a kid, my dad told me if I was going to participate in sports, I might as well give it everything I have. I can honestly say that I've given everything I have to being a professional soccer player these past 18 years. There were good days and there were bad days, but I tried to embrace every single one. My body is finally telling me that it's time to give everything I have to my next adventure, so this will be my final season as a professional soccer player. There are thousands of people that I owe a thank you to. Hopefully in the coming days, months, years, I can do that in person. But just know, if you're reading this, I appreciate your love and support. It means the world to me. I do want to say thank you to MLS, FC Dallas, Toronto FC, and of course the Colorado Rapids for giving me the opportunity to make a career doing what I love. But mostly I want to thank my family and to my parents and siblings for giving up countless weekends and holidays to allow me to live out my dreams. To my wife Shelby for being my number one and hottest supporter, even if you still don't know the difference between a header and a yellow card. 
and to my boys, Joey and Ryan, for giving me a valid excuse for being tired every morning at training. Your love and support has meant the world to me. I'm often asked what advice I would give to young players just starting their careers. It's simple. Embrace every single day, the good days, the bad days, and everything in between. While the days are long, believe me, the years are short. You might as well give it everything you have. Without further ado, my conversation with Drew Moore. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for chatting with me. Um, it is, for everyone listening and watching this, it's 8.15 in the morning, which I was just saying before we started are definitely dad hours. They are. Is so, that early for you? No. No. Okay. I'm just not a father. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Um, but I do feel like of, of all the cities, Saturdays um, in D.C. for people my age and honestly your age still, uh, nobody gets up until like 1 p.m. And then they go to brunch, and then they nap, and then they go out. Um, so we're going to be, it's going to be nice and quiet just it, for a while. Yeah, I, haven't, I don't think I've seen a single person. No, and you won't. Okay. You won't. I like that. I don't really like people. <laughs> well, they're all nursing hangovers, so if you really don't like them, then you'll be grateful that they're experiencing the worst part of, of existence right now. Maybe so. I should make a lot of noise. <laughs> um, okay, so... I want to start this interview off by asking the following question. When was the last time you Googled yourself? Not that long ago. Um, I would say within a, a month, within the last month. Okay. Was it just Drew Moore MLS or like Drew Moore in quotes or? Just Drew Moore. Just Drew Moore. Yeah, that's usually how, that's usually how I Google myself. So. Okay. Are you competing with any other famous Drew Moores or did, did what you want to show up pop up? I'm the most famous true war. Okay. And I also don't have an E at the end of my name, so I think that helps. True, yeah. true, true, true. Yeah. Does Google ever think you're misspelling it though, or it just takes a They minute. always try to finish it with an E. Okay. <laughs> like everybody. Having no E at the end of my name, believe it or not, has been more difficult than you would think. I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. Um, I ask because I did not Google you for this interview. I just know what I know about Drew Moore because you've been around for so long, which um, is fantastic, by the way. Thank you. I thought long and hard about the um, an interview I did with Chris Wondolowski this mm -hmm. time last year and how weird it was to know that the likelihood of someone ever living their entire career in MLS like that is just not, for the foreseeable future, I think not going to be as much of a thing. So the fact that you've played as many minutes as you have and as many, have made as many appearances as you have is insane. Um, are you attempting to break like Dax McCarty's record or are you just like vibing? No, well Dax is still playing fairly regularly. True, true, true. Game, you know? and so I don't really <clears throat> think too much about records like that. Obviously a lot of people like to bring them up. Um, <clears throat> I think I hit my 400th appearance La uh, towards the end of the season last year and the club made a big deal of it. It was, it was awesome, you know? Right, right. Uh, I, I think back when I was uh, kind of more in my prime and I was playing regularly day in and day out, uh, I thought about stuff like that. You know, like, oh, you know, have the most appearances with new starts or whatever. But I think you hit a certain point in your career where you're not a regular anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you still contribute and you still, you know, want to be a regular you still want to play as much as you possibly can um but it, it just becomes a thing where your body just you can't do it day in and day out and so you almost uh well you still come in and compete and, and be a professional you you and maybe enjoy the ride a little bit more than than you did and some of the the little things you enjoy a little bit more than uh, uh than you did earlier in your career you know? right right well the ride looks completely different now I was thinking back to the last time the Rapids won the MLS Cup and you were there. What, um, as you kind of travel around to like these new stadiums, these new clubs, what are some of the things that make you sit back and think, OMG, like MLS has made it? Or things that impress you now? Everything. Everything. And you talk about coming in 18 years ago, there was only 10, 12 teams in the league, 12 teams. Chivas USA and Real Salt Lake were in their first year, yeah. my rookie year. Um, you know, where we used to stay, how we used to travel, um, 
food looks different. <laughs> the stadiums obviously look completely different. It's it's unbelievable, and, and to think that you know, I don't want to be the, the old man here, you know, the, the veteran. But what what kids get these days is nothing like what what we got when we first came into the league in two thousand five. The league was only in its tenth season, you know. Um, it's 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 unbelievable. I mean, I could talk all day about the differences we're chartering now. We're staying at nice places like this. We're eating, you know, food that you know I would have only gotten on a special occasion as a kid. <laughs> food you know? that fuels for like a professional athlete. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, it's again, it's another reason why I would love to do this as long as I possibly can, and it's another reason why I still do it, even though it hurts almost every single day to train. And to play in games and stuff um, because of how far this league has come. I'm, I'm really proud of the league. I'm really proud to still be in it, but but most of all, I'm just thankful for for you know what I get to call my job every single day still. Yeah, which the chartering is probably to me the thing that but they talk about this in women's sports too. They're like, when are you going to get their own basic accommodations? And I know that the MLS has always been fighting for that space to be taken more seriously. And so when it occurred to me that charter flights were a relatively new thing, I thought, okay, I'm glad that this wasn't a huge news piece because it should have been happening a long time ago. So let's just one and done, put it in the CBA and move on. Yeah, and it, it should have been done a long time ago. And I haven't heard anything uh, about whether that's ever going to change, you know. I, I think COVID was obviously what brought in the, the need for chartering. Mm -hmm. um, we had in the CBA where I think this year we would have been up to maybe 10 legs of charter, of mandatory charters. I don't know if it's going to go back eventually because we're always going to be with COVID really from now moving forward, aren't we? So right. I haven't heard that chartering is going to stay or that chartering is you know, going to go back, back away. We're going to go back to commercial. Um, I hope it stays. And, and it, it really is a game changer. If the if the sports can you know can do it, then, then they should. I'm, I'm not joking. It's a game changer. Oh yeah, no, I I completely agree. Although I do miss the days um, where friends of mine would say they were traveling back with the team on like a Southwest flight, <laughs> <laughs> sitting next to them. Yes, yeah, like in the middle seat oh, that yeah. no dude from the team wanted to to <clears throat> claim, which I think is. Um, such a novelty, I think, and we. I think a lot about the growth of the league because 100% of my content is about documenting um, things from the fan perspective, what the uh, MLS looks like from city to city, but also how you can enjoy American soccer and where it's headed and why you should hop on the train now. Are there things from MLS 1.0, I guess as they call it, that you are gonna miss things that, that you hold on to dearly? Uh, some of the uniforms, maybe. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. I'm thinking of Dallas Burn right now. <laughs> so you don't know this about me because you don't know me, but I am a certified horse girl. Okay. And the lack of horses in any sort of like, <laughs> team branding is really heartbreaking to me. <laughs> I know I, I know Adidas has been great to the league and they've been great to me as well throughout my career. Very um, politically correct answer. Uh, well, <laughs> until they dropped me in my 15th season. But uh, oh, we, <laughs> we, Emilio left, you can tell. But, <laughs> no, it was funny. My, uh, I've been with these for 15 years, and which was amazing. Right. And, and my wife went to order some stuff with our Adidas symbol and card, you know, and it didn't work. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk to my agent about it, you know. This must be a mistake. Oh, uh, exactly. exactly. <laughs> oh, I mean, my God. The funds in. Uh, so, I, I, of course, I, I forgot and didn't, didn't speak with my agent. She tried a couple weeks later. She's like, babe, like, it's not working. Like, yeah. I'm trying to get our boys shoes, you know? So I was like, okay. And herself some shoes probably too. So I talked she to her. She deserves it. <laughs> she Mrs. Moore deserves it. Yeah, she puts up with me every day and her boys. Um, <clears throat> so finally I called my agent. He was like, uh, hey, Adidas, oh, you're not with Adidas. <laughs> Like, they're not going to even tell me after 15 years, you know? Was it just like a contract expired? In yeah, January? basically. And, and but still. I had been on one years for, for a long time. At okay. that point. You know, it was just yeah. I think it was kind of a contract I hadn't really thought of. I took it for granted, I guess. So um, I miss you, Adidas. But no, technically, I'm still Adidas with the team. You sure, know? Sure. But I miss, like, 
you know, back when, even before, like, I, I played in the game, like, so just, I mean, just the classic, the galaxy uniforms, the DC oh my gosh, uniforms, yeah. you know, yeah. the Dallas uniforms, the, the original San Jose Clash uniforms, Tampa Bay Mutiny, like, I don't, you know, I, I don't think we'll ever go back to those days, but those are yes. the glory days of the, of the yes. kids, you know? I, they do not make them like they used to, and um, I'm thinking of the, I know it's not Adidas, but I'm thinking of the Nike kit for the U.S. Men's National Team that was leaked. I don't know if uh, you've seen that. I it's, have, yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I have, but I haven't, you know. Oh, yeah, um, sure, sure. <laughs> I, I, we can only speculate. It yeah. has holes for arms. Yeah. It fits. Mm -hmm. I think every, it'll fit everyone who's yeah. wearing it, which is <laughs> That's fantastic. Half battle in New Jersey, <laughs> right? No, but again, I just think it's you know, I guess eventually you run out of ideas. I, I don't know. Do I, you? I, yeah, well, you may. It, you it may. seems like it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Nike it has some pretty creative minds. I feel like there. So they're somewhere. Yeah. Well, maybe they, they took the, the year off. I don't know. You know what I. I think that that's a very kind answer. <laughs> We're gonna go with it. I try to be nice. Um, speaking of the World Cup, I I did say I haven't googled you, but I did listen to a lot of interviews you've done, time you've given to others, which it's been a while. Yeah, I don't I, usually get requested anymore, so I appreciate you aw, thinking about. Me. You're welcome. I thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I can't remember. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> I. No, I love having conversations with people who have seen some stuff. Yeah, I've seen some stuff. Um, and the World Cup is included. I did listen to your interview with Bobby Boswell um, on the MLS Players Association podcast. And I was thinking the, the World Cup in Qatar will be my first. Um, I picked a very interesting wow, one yeah. to go to. Yeah, I'm like desperate for the content. Yeah, absolutely. I also envision myself living in one of those like fire fest style huts that they had to make super last minute and just like make again making content out like of it. Blast. Yeah, we shall see. Um, however, I wanted to go because it's the second, the the only World Cup for the men before 2026 when it's here. And I know you went to games in Dallas where you grew up. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a long way of, of asking a very simple question. I feel like soccer has such a presence in Dallas and uh, among to the American soccer and MLS community. But I can't tell if it's still fighting for a place among all the other sports that happen in Texas, football most notably. Um, do you? How have you seen soccer kind of take up more space in Dallas, and what do you see it looking like in 2026 when their games played there? Yeah, I think Dallas has always been huge for youth soccer. Mm -hmm. um, they have the Dallas Cup, the you know one of the bigger youth soccer tournaments in the world. I know it, it was for a long time when I was growing up. I think they still do the Dallas Cup, and um, teams from all over, all over the world come and participate. It's certainly it, there's its limits with the Dallas Cowboys being there, and then you know, Dallas has the, the Stars, the Mavericks, the Texas Rangers, um, a bunch of the uh, colleges in the area, even outside of the area, University of Texas, Oklahoma University, yeah. Texas A&M, Baylor, um, you know, take some of the sports attention as, as well, and so. <clears throat> it's a tough market and it always has been. You, you know, even when I played for FC Dallas, you could just tell that they put the stadium up in Frisco, which was a big move. Frisco is, is obviously a, a very rapidly growing city and okay. has been now for 15, 20 years. And so I think I think that's a good spot. The attendances seem to be doing well um, for FC Dallas, finally, kind of. Um, and I, you know, I, I feel like I can say that is. I was a Dallas Burn fan from yes. day one. I yes. was drafted by FC Dallas, and they struggled for a while, and, and it seems to be doing well. I think you know when when the World Cup comes to, to Dallas, it, it'll be a great host city for games. Um, obviously, the stadium is massive, and uh, it's, you know it's Jerry Jones's house, you know, <laughs> the house of the Cowboys and stuff. Mansion. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think. You know, Dallas isn't a soccer city like maybe some of the, you know, places that have MLS teams now, but in terms of hosting a World Cup, I think 
it's a it's a great place with uh, a, a wonderful uh, Latino population, mm -hmm. um, a wonderful host stadium. Um, it, Texas is a state that I feel like a lot of foreigners think of when they think of the, the United States, you know. And so I'm I'm super happy that it'll be in my hometown and. and would love to be able to, to go to go to some games, uh, but yeah, it should be a it should be a great venue for it. Yeah, how old will your boys be by the time twenty twenty six is out? Twenty six, they'll be let's see, they're six and five now, so ten, 10. and nine. Oh, okay, yeah. nice. Not quite old enough to play. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> No, old enough to have a formative experience. Yeah, I was I, I was ten years old when it was there right. in '94, you know, and so there's that special link that's cool. And my dad took me to to a game at the at the Cotton Bowl, uh, right? In Brazil against the Netherlands in the in the quarterfinal game. Um, I don't know if if you heard the story, but we were supposed to go to a group match. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was just, you know, I was really getting into, into soccer. I had just, right. I had just joined my club soccer team, solar soccer club, which, you know, club soccer back in the day used to be like the thing. Now they have the academies yeah, yeah. and stuff, but yeah. we were supposed to go to Germany against Korea. And, uh, my little brother was born, like, I think the night before or something. <laughs> yeah. And so <laughs> we, we missed the game, you know? So, uh, I've forgiven my brother for that since then. Good. But my dad just happened to be in a soccer shop. I think we were getting, uh, he was he was getting me some, some new shoes or something. I wasn't with him for some reason. And he overheard somebody talking about, hey, I've got these tickets to the quarterfinal game at the Cotton Bowl. We, we can't make it or something. He he jumped on him. And <clears throat> that really was kind of my eye-opening experience to live soccer two years before, you know, formation of Major League Soccer. Well, I guess two years before Major League Soccer actually kicked off. Mm -hmm. and, to see Brazil and the Netherlands in the quarterfinals and the Cotton Bowl as a 10 year old. And, and, you know, the hair on my arm stands up thinking about right, it. Right, right. Which, the way that you described it, first, you then went to the next World Cup in France and saw the same teams play. Yeah. Insane. Yeah. But the way that you described it about that kid crying um, was one of those things where I thought, am I, am I ever going to get to the point where a team that I like in MLS? elicits this kind of emotion without being intoxicated. Um, and if I have kids, am I ever going to have an experience where they are that into it without it being a meltdown on something yeah. else? Yeah. Um, and I want, I want that uh, for the U.S. But I just, I mean, you see the development, like you said, club soccer turning into the academy and uh, Dallas being to my knowledge, and probably for a long time, the standard for academies and, and youth development. And I think to myself, so many businesses and coaches and anyone in the in the space and in industry sees 2026 as like another chance at a global stage. And so they're all preparing for that. Um, and I don't, it, it brings me back to what we originally talked about. I don't know from there, if careers like yours and Dax's and Chris Wondolowski's are going to be around anymore, if if the expectation is if you are incredibly successful out of an academy, you go to Europe. If you had to do your career, um, not all over, but if it started today, yeah. what would the what would the um, idea of getting yourself to Europe? be in your mind? How much space in your brain would it take up? Probably a lot more than it used to. Um, yeah. First of all, if, if I was to restart exactly who I was, say rewind it 18, 19 years, I don't know if I, if I made it on this roster. Interesting. Just with the talent that is around now, obviously I would have, you know, with the academy system and stuff, I would have been developed slightly different, but I, like when I think now how good the league is and how you know, many good players there are, how athletic the players are, how fast the game moves. Man, like, I'm barely keeping up now. Really, the only thing that, that allows me to keep up is, is my experience, mm -hmm. is, is having seen a lot of things, as you so eloquently put it. You know? <laughs> I have veteran experience, and that is uh, a, like almost like a consulting job. When yeah. these guys come in, you're like, listen, <laughs> this is how it was, this is how it is, preparing yourself. Yeah, I, I just think... Um, 
I would have struggled, but you know, I do feel like I, I had an opportunity to go to a, a Norwegian club when I was kind of young. It was, you know, a lot of good young MLS players. They weren't jumping straight to the Premier League. They weren't going straight to the Bundesliga. Right. It was rare, obviously, but you know, some some of the Danish teams, Norwegian teams, Swedish teams was a way to get over to Europe, and then you can see if you can make it to some of these other leagues from there. Mm -hmm. And for me, it just wasn't, you know, the contract wasn't quite enough. MLS was really starting to gain some steam. And I was just like, you know what, I'm, I'm happy at home. I'm happy playing domestically and, and continuing to develop here. And I was with FC Dallas at the time. And, and it was just before I signed my, my second contract with the league. And, and I said no to the Norwegian club. And I, I continued to stay in MLS for the rest of my career. And, and I feel like now, say, I would have been a high draft pick, um, you know, a, a, you know, a product that a lot of MLS teams would have been interested in. Europe would have been first on my mind for sure. It's, yeah. Um, and that's not meant to be a, a slight at MLS. It's just more and more players are making that leap and making impacts at their European clubs, whether it's the Premier League, whether it's the Bundesliga. Some guys that are probably playing right now as we speak. Um, Europe to me is still, and to, to these kids, is more enticing than MLS. Right, which I try not to think of as a slight to MLS because with what MLS Next Pro, with the academies, they're doing it right mm -hmm. at a certain level. Mm -hmm. They're just um, doing it differently yeah. at the league level, which I think makes for really great team dynamics. You guys have a ton of Hispanic players mm -hmm. on your team. Do you speak any Spanish? Not enough. Then? Not, Not enough. enough. <laughs> and, they, and they hate me for it because I'm from Texas. You oh, know? no. And some of these guys, Brian Acosta and Michael Berry, also played at FC Dallas. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, and they know enough English. And they're like, I don't know Spanish. You grew up in Dallas, Texas. Everybody. Did. And I'm like, I know. Because I'm white. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, that's, part the answer the, <laughs> that's, that's part of the reason. I didn't take Spanish in high school, unfortunately, either. Me either. So, me either. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I wish I knew more. Yeah. I know enough, though. I know enough. Well, I always think, I'm going to tell this story. I've told this so many times, but never with the camera on. Um, during COVID, I'm giggling just thinking about it. During COVID, uh, Tommy Thompson obviously became quite popular for mm -hmm. learning Spanish on Duolingo. And I think there were another couple of people at the league level who thought, you know what, that's a great idea. I'll start with Duolingo which has its pros, has its cons. But at one point during COVID, when the league was trying to continue generating content, continue keeping people engaged in lieu of there being games to play, they were doing this virtual talent show and had, I think like Will Trapp sing, which he's known to do, and um, a couple of the broadcasters and uh, Matt Doyle types were participating. Mm -hmm. There's one, I'm not even going to say who except for the player, Alejandro Bedoya was on this little panel um, judging the, the talent that was going on. And the talent was this one individual was doing a cooking demonstration mm -hmm. and they were speaking Spanish while they were doing it because I think they were making like a Hispanic dish. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. And so she's like explaining like, put this in, put this, add this, whatever. And... Um, and Bedoya like repeats what she says and goes, whoa, that's that's that Duolingo Spanish. <laughs> and I sat up and I was like, don't download Duolingo. That's so embarrassing. Because <laughs> I thought, man, I bet she tried so hard. Oh. And that would be me trying to like learn Spanish for the content, learn Spanish and put myself out there. And the first thing like from from some from the source, from like the expert was like, no, Oh, that's but not you it. know who, who's not going to shy away from calling somebody out? Who? Alejandro Bedoya. Oh, that's true. <laughs> that's probably true. You're absolutely right. It's one of the many reasons why I really like Alejandro. Good. Yeah. I'm glad. I like him too. And I'm, Philadelphia's yeah, I was gonna say. Uh, caused some really difficult times <laughs> for us both. Um, me as a DC United fan yeah. and you as a Rapids player, yeah, which me. Yes, that's true. Um, and also more seriously, like I, I'm a mere participant um, and I sit on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. I do think oftentimes 
as a season ticket holder, sometimes it really hurts when that like payment, that monthly payment uh, goes through. Um, well, as a player, I appreciate that you continue to make that. Yeah. Payment. Well, I'm, cur I'm currently contractually obligated. Well, so. <laughs> but you do that yourself. You right, right. Do that, so. You put your body on the line. You uh, make sacrifices for yourself, for your family, uh, and you're still here, which is really, really impressive. Thank you. I don't, um, another thing that I took away from one of the interviews you did was that you are truly just taking it day by day, year by year, and you expressed, like, you just don't bounce back the way that you used to. Um, but I know whatever it is that you do, retirement or otherwise, how soon on the horizon it is that you still want to be involved in soccer. What does the next phase look like for you? How do you want to be involved? Yeah. Well, it's something that, you know, what's what's next after playing? I've thought about for 10 plus years now. You're like, all right, yeah. <laughs> let's get our act together. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And I feel like I have my act together as together as I did 10 years ago yes. when I first started thinking True. about it. True, I believe that. I think that's pretty normal. Um, I'm in a, super lucky to be in the situation I'm in um, back at the club um, where I kind of played, I would say, in my, my prime years. Uh, I think when people think of me, they think Colorado Rapids. A lot of people think I was born and raised in Denver, Colorado, yeah. because I have played for the Rapids for a long time. Um, I know uh, the the front office people really well here in Colorado. I know Roth and Fraser obviously extremely well. Um, and so when, when I have sat down and talked with like like Corey Smith, uh, you know, the, the GM, the, uh, he, he and I again have a good relationship and he says, if you know, whenever you're, you're done playing, there will be a spot here for you if, mm -hmm. if this is where you want to be. Um, so something within, within the club would you know, at least to start with, would, would be great because my wife and I loved in Colorado. We, I'm so glad. Yeah, we, yeah. we would love to raise our boys there. Um, it's a great place. Uh, it's funny because my wife's from New Jersey. She's that okay. Italian, yeah. New Jersey, you know, they all live on the same block. Yes. Um, they yell at each other from <laughs> across the street. You They're know. like, do you love each other? And like, yeah, we wouldn't live anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's really loud in here. <laughs> well, when my, my wife first moved out to Denver before she was my wife, um, you know, she was she was dead set on eventually raising kids in New Jersey yeah. and getting back there and stuff. And within about three months of living in Colorado, she was like, never going back to New Jersey, I'm never <laughs> living on the East Coast, this is where I'm staying, you know, and so, um, so we love Colorado, mm -hmm. um, but something that I'm, I'm also super interested in it, um, is broadcasting, um, yeah, yeah, possibly yeah. being a commentator. When I had my knee injury back in 2014 and 15, I broadcasted a couple of our games as the color guy, um, the color commentator, and, you're going to um, get this, yeah, I see this guy, excuse me, sir, you're He's, not invited. Is okay, he he's good. Okay. Yes, color. Do you prefer that over play by play? Yeah, color. I think you know, play by play, like, is just a, a, a completely different. I mean, I feel like you almost have to go to school for that. Like, I'm, I'm so impressed with the play by play guys. But the color guys are the ones that are you know, should be a little bit more knowledgeable about the X's and O's and the breakdowns yeah. and stuff like that. Um, I just don't know if. Everybody's like, oh, you'd be such a great coach, you know? And I just I don't know if I have coaching in me. Really? Yeah. What makes you think that? The main thing is I feel like I'm too nice. Oh. Um, <laughs> I've had some nice coaches. Robin's a nice guy. Rick right. Andy's a nice guy. Um, but I have a hard time telling people no or that they're not good enough or that this is why they're not in the 11. This is why they're not in the right. state roster. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, like, there's a lot of a lot of times. There's a lot of insecurity in coaching. A lot of moving around. Um, I just don't know if I'm if I'm cut out for the the pressure of that. Even as a player, a professional player of 18 years, coaching to me uh, sounds like a lot that I'm just not prepared for. That makes sense. I think the idea of breaking the news to someone about their livelihood. Uh, really stresses me out. 
So, and I'm so far, I'm so far removed from the world that you guys. Yeah, but that's the thing. Some people are great at it, but just being good at it doesn't mean it won't eat at you right. all the time. I feel like, right? You know. Well, and as um, a fan of a team who's gone through some recent coaching shifts, I think that there's. Um, there's a way to command a room or command a team and a way to get people to show up. And there's been this, because of what's happened with us with Lasada and then um, Wayne Rudy coming in, there's this big conversation, I think, between the balance of like having the locker room and then having the results. And I am so heartless with it. I'm like, I don't care how it feels in the locker room. Like, I don't care if you guys have your feelings hurt. I want to see a win. Like, yeah, give me no. a win, just one. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, no, those are, I have to remind myself that so much, there's so much more than the 90 minutes that I show up for. Right. Um, and I think that that's one thing as a fan that I can't ever wrap my mind around, like what the locker room looks like after a win, what it looks like after a loss. Um, I know so many people ask questions like, who chooses the music? Do you guys drink beer? What do you celebrate? And yeah, I mean, there's some of those things that I could guess, yeah. but it's just such a hard visual to have. And, and it's also a hard thing to translate into what that means for her on the field, actually. Yeah. And I think players do think about what, how fans feel, what they think, what, you know, and obviously with social media these days, we know how fans feel and what they think yes. and what they're saying. Yes. And, Maybe back 20, 20 years ago, it, it was different. You know, we would play and we would think about how we felt about it, how, how our teammates felt about it, how our coaches felt about it, the fans. It was kind of like, yeah, you know, we hope they had a good time. We hope they liked us. We won. We hope they liked yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. Now, now we know, and it's important. Um, there, there is extra pressure because of how much the league has grown, um, how many fans are now filling the stadiums, some of the places we're going to and some of the atmospheres we're playing in front of. And again, because of social media, it's important to players how fans feel and what they think. And it does affect us. We do think about it every single day. And any player that tells you he doesn't, he's he's lying, you know? It's, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's one of the blessings and, and curses of, of social media, just knowing what, what people think about you. And uh, it, it is important to go out and, and give everything you have and um, show that you care and show that you're willing to grind and, and do all the, the little things that sometimes get overlooked to try to get the results. You know, it's, it's, a, it's again, it goes back to it's a different world now than it was when I first came into the league. Yeah, which we're gonna end on the intro. I, I want you to help me list your accolades here. I know you've won two MLS Cups with a Western Conference team and an Eastern Conference team. Mm -hmm. But the MLS Cup with the Western Conference team, yes. we were actually the Eastern Conference champions because of the playoff format in 2002. Oh, okay. What? So, <laughs> what a long way you've come. <laughs> so, we, so eight teams made the playoffs that year. Okay. And it was the top two teams from the West and the top two teams from the East and then the next four best teams. Oh, and interesting. five through eight were all Western Conference teams. So two okay. of us had to go into the Eastern side. So the San Jose Earthquakes and the Colorado Rapids played for the Eastern Conference Championship every right. year. Sure, yeah, sure, so sure, sure. Like, oh, That's, I have to remind myself this year, I'm like, Nationals in the West. It doesn't make yeah, sense, but yeah. here it is. But that year, makes even less. East, right? This is true, yeah. yes. So yeah, two MLS Cups. Okay. Um, okay, so two MLS Cups, you've been um, named to the All-Star team one time. one time in what year? 2015. 15. Great year. Great year. Uh, uh, what else do you have? You've done something in Canada. I have uh, three Canadian championships. Three Canadian championships. I do have a supporter shield with TFC. Supporter shield? Okay. I did lose two of those cups. Okay. Um, this has been really great. Thank you for that. <laughs> I lost I just want to lose my I lost two. Oh, I see it. Well, you, are, you have been. <laughs> <laughs> I've also lost in two U.S. Open Cups. Oh my gosh, yeah, what years is this? I know, right? No, the Open Cup is very important. Very <laughs> important. Everybody takes it the sometimes, same amount of series. Sometimes teams that only win three or four regular season games win the Open Cup. 
I don't know any teams like that in I DC as a resident of this, <laughs> this city. I have no idea what you're talking about. Actually, I will say, and we can wrap it up here. Th thank you, by the way, for all your time. Thanks, man. I became a fan of DC United in 2014. If I had become a fan the year I moved here in 2013, I would not have become a fan. <laughs> that 14 was a little better than 13. Yes, was I. 13 the year they won the Open Cup. Yeah, and I think it's it's so interesting to me just how generous, um, even the league, not just like DC United's ownership management, but the league was. The next year, they're like, "Come back, Coach of the Year. You did it, buddy." I'm like. Ben survived. I, he survived last year, and he's surviving this year. He can't have him back after a long time. Yeah, he's still here. I love Ben, though. I yeah. Don't know. Oh yeah. No, Ben's, we love Ben. Also. Uh, he's he's the man. Yeah. I, I a couple times I got called in the national team way way back a long time ago. He was around, and even playing against him when he was with DC, just such a fun guy to be around. He's great. Yeah. He's great. I, that sounds really insincere. He is great. No, he is. He is. He's currently. I believe you. Uh, <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> like you know him better than I do. We're confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's making. He makes art now. Does he? Yeah. He has a studio and he sells. He sells art out of. No way. Shop. Good for him. Yeah. He's. That's like. It's very to to think of a Texas um, a Texas icon. It's very like. George Bush esque. Okay. Like you, you got a long tenure, yeah. and then you just retire, yeah. and you're like, I need to, I need yeah. to do something else. And people, make but, art. but like people, like it's almost like they like you even more after you know. It's like, oh, this guy's actually oh yeah, pretty cool. Like I like it. Like what is know? that? It's not even like hindsight twenty twenty. It's like the it's, nostalgia is a hell of a drug. Yeah, you're yeah. Like, I love them. Did you? Yeah. Did you and now it's almost like I miss him. You know? Yeah, come now back. He's gone. I miss you. We're losing games, Ben. Come back. Yeah. So just <laughs> down there. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for um, having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, Sorry to right. make you wake up before anybody else. No, I'm going to go get some food. I'm yeah. going to go to the National Book Festival at oh, the Convention wow. Center. Home Depot, maybe later? Pro honestly, probably. I needed to stand and stay in a dresser of mine for oh, a while now. And it's a long weekend, Labor okay. Day weekend. It is, so. it is. Yeah. Do, do you need something from Home Depot? Um, I hope not. Okay. I'm not. My wife's more of the Home Depot person she, than me. Actually. I was going to say that yeah. when you said she's from New Jersey. Oh, yeah. And for how long it, it, she's she's done a great job of supporting you. Yes. She sounds like she's the one in charge. Listen, I'm not going <laughs> to share it, but I'm not afraid to admit that my wife is the boss. Perfect. She is. Right. She is the absolute boss. I love that. That's the perfect note to end on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.